You may be seated. Thank y'all. Good job. Appreciate y'all. Amazing grace. This word that's thrown around quite often in the form of a song. It's uh, actually was a song published in 1779, written by a guy named John Newton. Uh, the song itself was not even named Amazing Grace. That was later coined from the first words of the first verse. It was called Fate's Review and Expectation. Some say it was written to be a sermon, others a poem, and then, of course, a song. But the writer has a very unique story that I think brings a little bit of light into the meaning and the purpose behind this song, Amazing Grace. He was uh, actually pushed to enroll in the Royal Navy at age 18. John Newton was a very wealthy guy, came from a wealthy family. His father was a slave trader uh, going to get slaves from West Africa and bringing them to, uh, back to England and enslaving them. And, of course, lots of transitions between there and the U.S. and other things. He was also an investor in the slave trade, in the ships and so forth. Uh, somewhere along the way, uh, John Newton decided to desert from the military, from his post as a Royal uh, Navy man. And in that, he was, went through a lot of trouble. There was many things that flowed out of that until ultimately he was enslaved himself. Now, the irony of that is his family had been so involved in the slave trade, he now found himself off the coast of West Africa, enslaved uh, by Sherba princes uh, as a slave there, was enslaved for a little over a year. It took him almost three years to get out of that situation, some of the moving around he did, before he was ever traveling back in 1748, going back to England uh, as a free man, but a changed man nonetheless. And somewhere along the way, outside the coast of Ireland, the ship met a, a tempest, a storm, and uh, as the ship was for sure going to go down, he did something that was completely unconventional for him. He cried out to God. And in crying out to God, he said, if you save me from this, if you spare me, I will serve you. And much like the many who have prayed that prayer, God did save him. God did spare him. He got home, but he, he didn't hit the ground running, if you will. He didn't hit the ground running in his faith, and some other things happened, and somewhere along the way over the next decade, he became a little bit more serious about his faith because of the convictions he was beginning to feel about slave trading particularly. As he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he began to see the slaves as people, not as merchandise or property. He started writing papers and disclosing things like the numbers of people. 80% of those who were brought over uh, on the slave ships would, would die a dreadful, horrible death. Only 20% would make it to become slaves. And, and they were okay with that up until John Newton revealed that. In fact, at some point in his faith journey, he began to work as a, as a cleric. He began to, to work in some form of ministry in an Anglican church. And begin to gain some respect both from the people uh, over the church as well as just parishioners. He caught the eye of a young man named Wilbur Wilberforce who was on parliament. He was a part of the parliamentary government there. And he began to lean into John Newton to seek spiritual advice of all things. And John began to mentor him and other guys. At some point in time, uh, Wilbur Wilberforce decided he was going to leave Parliament. But at the nudging of, of John Newton, he said, no, I want you to stay and I want you to be a voice of abolition for the slave trade. And that became quite a fight, as you can imagine, because it was a very wealthy and very expensive industry. Ultimately, he won that battle. Wilbur Wilberforce actually won the battle and abolish slave trade as it was known in that time. Later in life, John Newton became an actual pastor of the Anglican church. Very well-respected preacher in his own right, a poet, songwriter. And he actually began to, to write songs like this, many, many songs, but this one just was different. Some point along the way, his humility drove, drove so deep within his heart and his spirit, he could often be found not standing in, in the church preaching, but sweeping the church, cleaning the church, and doing the things uh, that just expressed his greatest humility because his word uh, to the Lord would, if, would be that if he would diminish and he would humble himself, God would uh, exalt him in a due time. Along that journey, he lost his eyesight, which really brings much more prevalence 
and poignancy to the song itself because one of the very popular uh, verses within there is, I was once blind, but now I see. But interestingly, as we would find out in retrospect, that John Newton wrote this song not when he gained his sight, but when he lost it. It was losing his physical sight that he would able to pin the words, I once was blind, but now I see, because he was dealing not with a physical vision of sight, but rather a spiritual one. Amazing grace. I think it's a word that we know little about. I had a guy leave the first service, and I pray this would be the case with you as we lay this before you. He said, now I understand grace. That's my heart and my prayer. If you would stand with me today as we read Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, out of respect of his word, let's read together. It says, this is the word of the Lord Zerubbabel, not by might or by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forth the capstone with shouts of grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands, I love this, shall also finish it. Somebody say amen. Amen. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, Zechariah says, for he has despised the day of small things. This is where we get that, that phraseology, which has become an idiom, a saying that don't despise small beginnings. For these seven, or the seven spirits of God, rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. They are the eyes of the Lord, which scan to and fro throughout the earth. Let's pray. Jesus, help us today to preach this word. Me, a natural man, I offer nothing, but God, through you, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God, your words today through me can change us all. Start here. In Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. Keep in mind, the first temple was destroyed in 586 B.C. at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, and they took the people of Judah, specifically the Jews, into captivity. When they were released, 538 B.C., um, Zerubbabel was the first, one of the first ones to come back. And in so doing, he was petitioned, he was challenged, he was uh, given this, this mandate to rebuild the temple again that had been destroyed uh, many years before. He began to do that uh, under the writing, of course, of, of Ezra, and he built for two years the foundation the foundation of what would become the temple of God, the place of worship, the place that would house the Shekinah glory, the the wonder glory of God. He met opposition, and for some 15 to 17 years, there was a halt in the building until God uh, called Zechariah and Haggai, those two contemporaries, to write, to prophesy to this leader of Judah to, to finish the temple. And he told him, he said, hey, there, there may be a great mountain in front of you, but I'll make it like a plane. I'll make the mountain melt like wax at my presence. And what you have started, the foundation of which you've laid, you will finish it. But not by your power, but by the Spirit of the Lord, by the power of God, which is echoing throughout the annals of history and in our hearts today. Anything that you're called to do, make no mistake about it. He which hath begun a good work in you will also complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God's not asking you to do the work. He's just asking you to be available and start walking in the work. And that's exactly what happened. And finally, it was finished about four years later, of course, to be destroyed again in 70 AD under Rome and will be rebuilt the third time uh, leading into, of course, the tribulation. I want I want to just bring a message today entitled Grace, Grace. But I want to answer a few questions before I lay before you the four types of grace that are found in the Word of God. And it simply lends itself to where this word comes from. Obviously, we hear it mentioned here in the book of Zechariah, uh, but, but really, did it come at that point? So there's two different philosophies, perspectives, or ways in which we can see Scripture. Keep in mind, the Old Testament is, is that prophecy, those things that are hidden, those things that are revealed in the New Testament. It's the schoolmaster, if you will, to everything we learn in the New Testament. 
It's specific in nature, so therefore we believe the Scriptures to be literal, so we follow and adhere to a literalism, aside from grammatical shifts in Scripture, i.e. metaphors, allegory, uh, alliterations, things of that nature, because we have to understand many things about Scripture. When you get into, of course, the book of Revelation, John is saying some things that he sees that he'd never seen before, so we don't necessarily apply literal translation to some of those things. We have to understand he's speaking with a simile or a metaphor. But the, but the problem with that, or, or I should say the, the antagonist with that, is that there is a covenant theology, which if we're not careful, can become a replacement theology. Covenant theology, you'll find more in Reformed uh, uh, Calvinism and things of that nature, which simply says that uh, the church and Israel are one and the same, that the church has replaced Israel. We don't, we don't believe that to be true. We believe there are distinct differences. We do believe, however, that uh, we were grafted as Gentiles into the promise of Abraham, but it doesn't absolve or dissolve or do away with uh, the children of Israel. We're going to prove here in a minute that uh, they're going to be dealt with in the tribulation period, a time of Jacob's trouble, uh, and of course, the time of reconciling and then the millennial kingdom. So there is a dealing with uh, those. Matthew 25 talks about the separation of sheep and goats. That's dealing with the Jews. So I say all that to say, then what is our, uh, our position? What do we adhere to? And, and in the 18th century, this is not very uh, old, the concept or the title of it, but, but it is a way to help us catalog or file scripture. Because any good student of the word will know that we have to understand context we have to understand uh, what God is saying to a person in the Old Testament. It may not be just laterally moved over here and spoken to you. Look to your neighbor right now and say, don't be reading other people's mail. Go ahead and tell them that. Why? Because uh, just because he told the rich young ruler, for example, in the New Testament, to go and sell everything he has and give it to the poor doesn't mean he's extending that to you from a literal sense. It was a literal story, and there's applications there. So we can glean from that. We call it dispensationalism. Dispensation is another way of just saying that we file things based on time frames of, of history from creation to the end of time that help us to see how God deals with his people, how he dispenses uh, his, his way to people. So the first we look at, of course, is from creation uh, to the fall, from Adam to the fall, and that is that of innocence. In, in innocence, the state in the garden, they didn't even know they were naked. We don't see that happen until after the fall when God asked him, who told you you were naked? And it was relegated from shame. But in the state of innocence, they had several mandates. Uh, they would subdue the earth. They would name the animals. Uh, they would multiply and be fruitful. That is to say, they would procreate. Not a, not a gift given to the angels. We see in Scripture where there was a time where angels fell in form of demons. And they had uh, intercourse with women and, and created a Nephilim or, or a giants in the day. It's very, very biblical. And you can read about it in Genesis. But the, the essence of it was very simple. That they would simply live in innocence, and they would live forever eating from the tree of life, never to die, and walk with God in the cool of the day. But that's the first dispensation, the way that God was dealing with his people. Second one, of course, is, is dealing with that of conscience. At the time that man fell, notice the first thing he noticed was what? I'm naked. There was a consciousness that came on board that was driven by that of sin and shame. Sin simply means missing the mark. So when you look at this idea of consciousness, we see that from the fall all the way to the flood. That's some 1,656 years. When we see that, we see some things unfolding. There's no rules. There's no laws. Just a man's own conscience and a man's own heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitfully wicked. Uh, who can know it? Uh, when you say, let your conscience be your God, which we often say may be well-placed, but wrong theology, because what happens is that simply means that a man does what is right in his own heart. And the end of that is destruction, as we see here. You say, can, can you prove that? Well, here's what happens in Genesis chapter 6. After that, this is, begins that consciousness. It says, then the Lord saw, in Genesis 6, 5, and 8, 5 through 8, the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every intent, the King James says, every imagination of his thoughts, of his heart, was on evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I've created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, birds of the air, fowls of the air. For I am sorry that I have made man, but Noah found grace or favor in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is not the dispensation of grace. So we can look here and say grace existed because he found it. It was dispensed to him by God. Now, one of the problematic points of this verse is King James says it repented God that he had made man. Here it says he was sorry that he did it. 
That is an anthropomorphism, which means we're giving human personal traits to a non-human deity. You say, well, God's not human. No, he's not human. He doesn't have hands and feet and eyes and mouth. And Why? Because he transcends time, space, and matter. He can't be contained in that. So when we say the hand of God was upon you, that's an anthropomorphism. It's giving a trait of a hand that cannot exist because it would be too big to exist in the context of what we know as space and time and matter. When we say the mouth of God, the voice of God, the eyes of God, look and hear and throw around the world, anthropomorphism. The same is true here for God being sorry, God re being re repentant. That, that's a very dangerous word if we don't apply the grammatical part of anthropomorphism, which says that basically for us to understand it, God is saying this, I'm really sorry that I even made you. I wish I'd have never made you. You say, well, that's not said. That's actually said in the book of Mark as we see he says that to false teachers. He, says that to, he said that to Judas, the person that will betray me, it would better be off that he never be born. For a person who causes a young one to stumble, he said they'd be better with a millstone tied around their neck and thrown into the sea. That means dead. So it is something that God says because God is holy. And when he looked upon man and his heart and his thoughts and his imaginations were on evil continually, God says, I'm going to destroy everything. And we can see God step on the precipice of Jeremiah chapter 18 in, in the context of, of fulfillment of prophecy where at this moment he, he looks over mankind and he said, I'm going to destroy every man, every beast, every man, woman, boy, or girl. And I'm going to take them away. It's going to be a genocide, not of just a race, but a genocide of the human race. Because God deals with things in his wrath in totality. There's, but there's always a remnant. And the remnant is Noah, who was the one guy who chose not to fit in, but to stand out. That'll preach, won't it? The reality is, is if he had chose to inundate himself with the culture, he would have drowned in and with the culture. But he stood out. He is called to be set apart. That's what it means to be the church, the ecclesia. It is that the called out is separate, the peculiarness of Noah. The reality is, is God indiscriminately destroyed all life, annihilating by way of his judgment and because of his justice. For those of us who say, hey, I just want God your justice. You don't want your, his justice. In his justice, you and I would be thrown in hell for eternity. It's the judgment because of his son, as we'll see in the dispensation of grace, that that sin that we owe, where justice would throw us into the penalty of hell forever and forever and forever, was cast over to his son. He paid our sin debt because we couldn't afford to do so. We're talking about the dispensation here of conscience. Thirdly, there's the dispensation of human government from the flood, from, from Noah's Coming out of that to Abram or Abraham, there's human government. This form of human government was still absent of laws, but it did contain some ordinances, the way that we would worship. We read that in, in the book of Job, how God was worshipped by Job. Job it was perfect and upright in all the land, and he would pray to God uh, you know, twice a day, even praying for and interceding on behalf of his kids. So there was some, some understanding of who God was and how to apply some degree of faith in following God. We see that in Abraham beginning of that this patriarchal period uh we see there abraham tithing there was there was all sorts of stuff even here but men was still left to rule over himself like the time of judges where there was no king and 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 people would just find their own way can i tell you we're not too far removed from that today people today call it relativism meaning this if it's true to you then it must be true for you the problem with that is, is it absolves the characteristic of God's absolute truth. Absolute truth does not change with time, does not change with culture. It does not change because you don't agree with it or I don't agree with it or because, bless God, some government don't agree with it. It is absolute. You can count on it. You can take it to the bank and it is not going to change. So when we understand that, then we move to the next level of a dispensation, which is that of promise, which starts with the Abrahamic covenant. He brings uh, Abraham in, and what does he say? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you land, seed, and blessing. The land is this, Abraham. The covenant I'm going to give you is everywhere you put your foot. I want you to leave the earth, Chaldees. I'm only giving you a promise. I'm not giving you the details. I'm not giving you the outflow. I'm not giving you the end result. I want you to leave the earth, Chaldees, the land of your father, and I want you to go to a place that I'll show you. 
He says, as you're going, everywhere you put your foot will be yours. That'll be the territory that I'm going to give you. Uh, we believe scholars today say that they yet to yet have received or put their foot on even 8% of what God has promised them via the promised land. Because they still haven't gone into it. Why? I'll tell you why. The promise was land, seed, and blessing. He would bless those who bless them, curse those who curse them. But the middle part was that of the seed. Remember what he told him? Even in your old age, you're going to bring forth a child from your seed. So what did he do? He tried to help God be God. As Sarah heard that. They heard. She said, go lay with my, my handmaid, Hagar. Have a child. He did that. And out of that came a little boy named Ishmael, which was not the child, was not the child of promise. But God's promise was true that, hey, whatever came from his seed was going to live and be a great nation. That's the way he promised him. But he came back to him and he said, no, 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 that's not the one. The one that I'm talking about is going to come from you. And Sarah had another child, said, name him Isaac, which means God is laughing or God has the final word. And then what happened? You say, how big of a deal is that? Anytime we try to help God be God, we come up with an Ishmael. That's the illegitimate part of the promise. Why does it matter? Because today the, the fury and the dialogue that you see between Muslim and, and, and uh, Israel, or you see between Palestine and Israel, you can trace the line directly from uh, that of Ishmael to what we have today. That's the problems that exist. Why does that exist? Because uh, the Muslims, as a general rule, speaking specifically of Ishmael, they follow the lineage from a person named Esau, which was the firstborn, all right, of Isaac. But that wasn't the blessing. The blessing came to Jacob. That was the way God did it. He sold his, his birthright. But they trace him from Esau. Now, why is that important? Because if you trace the lineage from a guy named Esau and not Jacob, you trace it all the way down to a guy named Muhammad. You ever heard of him? He's the prophet, and that's the whole point. If you trace Jacob through the lineage, you come up with a man, maybe you've heard of him, his name's Jesus, and that's the promise. So this is a dispensation of promise. But may I add again, all he had was a promise. Can I tell you something? Maybe that's all God gives you today is a promise. Let me tell you something. Maybe you don't have the results yet, but I'm going to tell you there's still a promise. I can't tell you how many people I've seen walk in a promise and just keep walking in a promise and keep believing God even when there's no evidence that it exists I have people in this room today and still people who are believing God for a precious baby. It is something I cry out to God on that behalf every single day. It is a burden in my spirit. And I have watched time and time and time again God give his promise realization and give them that precious baby. I don't know what your promise is today, but I'm going to tell you something. All he gave him, Abraham, was a promise, and he started walking. Can I tell you what to do? Get God's promise, stand on him, and keep walking and never look back. Not only... Is there a promise? But then we go from Abraham to Moses, or specifically on Mount Sinai, and we call it the dispensation of law. This is the beginning of a theocracy, not a democracy. A theocracy, not by the people, but of God, where God is sovereign, God is absolute ruler. It gave a place of law, it gave a place of judgment, and it gave specificity to the ordinance of worship. 613 laws to be exact of thou shalt and thou shalt not. Ten specific commandments broken into moral and divine altogether creating this picture of a law that could not be kept. A law that could not be performed because if we break one of the laws, we're guilty of them all. If we tell a lie, we might as well be a murderer. If we've coveted, we might as well be an adulterer, etc., etc. And so then it left us hanging on, again, this precipice of how do I do this? How can we do it? So then we go from Moses to the cross, the dispensation of grace. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of your works, lest you would boast. Jesus obeyed the law to its T. He did not sin. He was perfect, sinless. He fulfilled the law. Therefore, watch this, broke the curse of law, sin, death, and hell. He took the victory out of the grave. He took the penalty out of sin, and he absolved it. He paid for it. He became it. And then guess what? You and I get to walk in the unmerited favor of a holy God. That is grace. Grace, grace. And then from the cross, to a point in time of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, I'll fly away, is a time called the final seven years of Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy called the tribulation. It's not about you and me. It is specifically a time of Jacob or Israel's trouble. 
It is about uh, judgment of the nations of Israel and ultimately about uh, reconciling them back to himself. That's why we can't apply re replacement theology. It's because the, ch the church exists, but we're in heaven during those seven years. We're uh, partaking of the marriage supper of the Lamb. We're going to be standing before the beam of seat of Christ, the judgment seat of Christ, not to be judged for heaven or hell, but to be judged, Travis, by the things that we've done for the glory of God that he gets the glory for, and we'll get a crown, one of seven crowns, that we turn around and cast back at his holy and righteous feet to say, you are worthy. I made it, but I made it with a crown, and that crown is yours. But, but here's the, the bad thing. That goes all the way up until the time of tribulation, and then there's a thousand year, which is the seventh dispensation called the millennial kingdom, a thousand years. Here's what we know to be true. From creation to the flood was 2,000 years. From the flood to the cross was 2,000 years. From the cross to the day is 2,000 years. And we're about to finish that. That'll be 6,000 years. Then there'll be a thousand year millennial reign. That's seven. Seven is number for perfection and, and completion in Christ. And then there'll be a new beginning, which is eight, which is the after the millennial kingdom, which is the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem coming down and so will it ever be forever and forever and forever. But here's the gravest caveat to that, is at the end of this kingdom millennial, before the newness is made, there is a great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20, where all the sinners, not us, all the sinners who rejected Jesus Christ will stand one by one, Satan, the false prophet, the antichrist, and then one by one by one by one, the millions of people, billions of people that have ever been born that did not receive the love of the truth, some because they weren't told, and that's on us, which brings me to the next point. We will watch one by one as they're cast in the lake of fire, and we'll be weeping openly at that moment in heaven. We'll be weeping over the souls that were forgotten, overlooked, and cast in the lake of fire. How do you know that? Because the next chapter, Revelation 21, 3 and 4, said he'll wipe away all the tears from their eyes. There'll be no more crying, no more death, no more sorrow, no more pain, for the former things are passed away. Behold, I see him sitting upon the throne, and he's making all things new. And then the new Jerusalem is coming down. Heaven is purged, the earth is purged, the meek shall inherit the earth, and then there shall we ever be with the Lord. Amen. Dispensations. And that's not even the sermon. Because the sermon is the four types of grace, but you can't understand grace until you understand the dispensation in which we live and how we got here. There's four types of grace I want to lay before you very quickly. If you're still with me, say amen. They're saving grace. And praise the Lamb of God that it's a grace. It's not something you can work for. It's not something you can inherit because mom or dad have money. It's not something extended only to, uh, to, to, to white people or, or only to black people or only to this person or this ethnicity. It's every nation, every kindred, every tongue, every people group, every creation, Mark 16, 15. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9, lay it out beautifully. It's for by grace that you're saved through faith. Grace is the means. Faith is the vehicle. Grace is God's gift to you. Faith is your gift back to God. And it's not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of your works, lest you would boast. If we felt like we could earn it through works-based theology, then here's the terrible tragedy of that. If we could work to gain it, then we can work to lose it. But if it's given as a gift, not upon my merit of being good, but upon his goodness, then I can't lose it because he never ceases being good. Amen. And the truth of it is, is you didn't find him. You didn't pursue him. He pursued you. He held you. He grabs you. He holds you now. He keeps you. Listen, until that wonderful and glorious day. There's nothing in the world you can do to get out of his hand. However, that, let me tell you something. Don't miss this now. There's things we can do where we break fellowship with God. And in breaking fellowship, we miss some things. We miss some blessings, y'all. When we're not obedient, that's what he wants now. He doesn't want sacrifice. He's done that once and for all. And what we do now is we apply faith. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, hey, faith without works is dead. Well, wait a minute, Mark. the same thing you're saying. No, no, no. I'm not saying you work to get faith. I'm saying when you have faith, work's going to follow. Right. Work is the things that you want to do because of what he's done for you. That's why we want to forgive the unforgivable. Because if we don't forgive someone, when our Father in heaven has forgiven us, there's a strong urgency and a strong caution there. We can't be saved and not forgive. Why? Because in light of the forgiveness that God has extended to you, the reciprocal in your mind is automatically to forgive others. I love this grace, saving grace, because it absolves any effort 
on my part to try and seek God's approval in an effort to keep him. It's not based on my goodness. It's based on his. Grace says, I loved you when you were unlovable. And I loved you on the basis of my perfect love. I love you because he says, I am love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17, 18 says, Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on that day of judgment. That's, that's beautiful, y'all. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Somebody look to your neighbor and say, you can't have fear if you have perfect love. Go ahead and tell your neighbor that. Y'all need to tell them that again. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves, includes partners with torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Why do we love him? Because he first loved us. Which brings us to this next point. Then in the context of grace, saving grace, then we say, well, where sin abounds, sin is missing the mark, grace does much more abound. So then we get into this, this glance of, really then, grace gives me a license to sin. Because if, if God's uh, grace covers me where sin is, and grace much more abound. In fact, in Scripture it says that. Well, then if that's the case, then let, us, let me sin so that grace may much more abound. He says, forbid not. It's kind of like this. That type of philosophy would be giving God your entire home but leaving one nail in that house to yourself that sticks out of a wall. Not a big deal until you hang a dead skunk on it. You give God your whole house, but you leave that one nail for yourself with a skunk on it. That staunch, that stink, that nasty will permeate the walls, the carpet, the ceiling. It'll contaminate the entire house. And as crazy as that sounds, that's exactly what many of us have done in our own life of faith is we've given him this, and we've given him that, and we might have given him everything, but we nail that one little nail to the wall and say, but you can't have that. You might as well hang a skunk on it because your faith stinks. Everything you do, you fall flat on your face. Everything comes up void. God will take no less than all. If he's not Lord over all, he's not Lord at all. And it's something that we have to lean into because the reality is, is he saved us to the uttermost. He, can I tell you something, why this matters to me? He didn't just save you from sins you have committed. He saved you from the penalty of sins that you will commit. Unbeknownst to you, there's things in the future that you will do against God's heart. And 1 John 1, 9 says, If I confess my sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me all of unrighteousness. There's, there's a little bit of a parenthetical there that I might need to offer. It still ought to break your heart when you break God's heart. Because if you can just sin and not feel anything, you are not saved. You are not endued with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because sin cannot counterpart in your soul, in your spirit, that is the temple of a holy God. If you can sin and it don't bother you, you're lost. That was not even in my notes. Secondly, very quickly, uh, Maliki, you want to come hang out with me? Justifying grace. Not only is there saving grace, there's justifying grace. Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> 22 through 25. I love this verse because it puts us all on the level field. For all have sinned and fallen short the glory of God. If there's, any, if there's any concern about who's in and who's out, we all have failed. Watch this. But being justified freely by His grace... Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as the propitiation or satisfaction of, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God has passed over the sins that we previously committed. You know why I love that so much, Lee? It's because Satan is called the accuser of the brethren. Do you know what the justification does? The justification will absolve any and shame or accusation that the enemy brings against you. This was so powerful that a man named Martin Luther got hung up right here. Martin Luther was a, was, was a Catholic priest, and he had been following the sacraments of the Catholic Church and the, the different things that had to be done as lay, uh, that had to be done laid out by the Catholic Church. 
And, and what does he do as a, as, as a man of God? He, he gets into God's Word, and he, he begins to read the book of Romans, and he gets this, and he's floored. He's like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. This justification means it's not about what I can do. I'm justified by his grace freely. So what does he do? He, he goes and tells his superiors, they say, no, get back at it, you're wrong. This is the Catholic Church, this is the mandate, this is what you do. He goes back maybe several times. Finally, he hits a wall, and he comes up with this fourfold picture of what just came from that. That we're saved by grace alone. The Latin is solo gratia. We're saved by grace alone in faith alone. Solo fides, faith alone. We're saved by grace alone, faith alone, in Christ alone, solo Christus. And we're saved according to the scriptures alone, solo scriptura. So if that's true then, then i got to dispute the Catholic Church. So he begins to pen what would become 95 disputations of the Catholic Church, better known today in 1517, he nailed to the wall of the door of Wittenberg, Germany, known as his 95 Thesis disputing and basically saying, guys, I'm out of here. Because of the justifying grace of God. Saved by grace. Justified. It's progressive. Justification doesn't happen until salvation happens. Then we come with one that's often overlooked completely. And boy, oh boy, this is the fear and trembling moment for me. It's called teaching grace. Titus 2, 11 and 14 says this. For by the grace of, for the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all men, teaching us, what? Denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for, notice those action words, denying, living, looking, for the blessed hope and his glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. But Mark, I don't understand the Bible. Hey, I did this in the first service. How many of you, just being honest, just be honest, how many of you have a little bit of trouble understanding the Bible when you read it. Absolutely. Still to this day, right? There's still things I read and I go, what does that mean? There's a couple of things. One could be, and I, I, I never would have said this in my early ministry, but one thing is I love the King James Bible because I love its poetic language. However, that can be incredibly, incredibly problematic for a new Christian trying to read. You get tied up in that Elizabethan language. Why? Because it was printed in 1611, so you're getting that, that Elizabethan Old English language. And it can, you can get lost in it, y'all. You absolutely can get lost in it. I, I tell people to remove that language, get the New King James Bible. There's many of them. American Standard is, is good. It's probably the most literal word-for-word -word translation. But again, if you've ever tried to translate Spanish word-for-word, -word, your subject-verb agreement is, is reversed, and it can, cause, it can convolute it. Same thing with that. I like the New, New King James. And I also love the New Living Translation, the NLT. I love that. I, I probably study more from that. I bought, our, I bought our whole staff one of those study Bibles in the New Living because it just, to me, it's just... It has a, they kind of use the Texas Receptus, which is the received text, same the King James used, and kind of derived it from there. I believe it's a literal translation, um, notwithstanding some juxtaposition of some words. It's not a big deal. This, that doesn't bother anyone, right? Anything I just said doesn't bother anybody. Let me tell you one that might. First Corinthians 2 and 14. Hear my heart. I'm just reading scripture. Look to your neighbor and say, he's just reading scripture. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. So there's one of two only. You walk in the flesh, meaning you're, you're surrendering to the flesh, you will never understand the Bible, ever. Secondly, this one's the scary one. 
you may not be saved. Because I have found the Holy Spirit in me, when I read something and I don't understand it, He is waking me up in the middle of the night and say, this is what that means. Or when I find myself in that great dilemma, you know, when things happen, I know that probably don't happen to y'all, but things happen in my life. He reveals it and calls it back to my remembrance, a word that I had not even studied to memorize, and he calls it back word for word. That's why, that, that's why Sammy and, and, uh, and Lee invest, and so many others of you invest in our children. We're hiding the God of, uh, word of God in their heart that they may not sin against you, O oh God. And then that day they can be unashamed, calling it back. So I'm not asking you to question your salvation. I'm just saying, if you're reading, 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 are you praying before God, open my heart and my mind. Let me have ears to hear, eyes to see. Let me have a heart that's receptive. Be in the spirit, if you will. Or maybe juxtapose that against some of the other context. Why is it important? Why is it important to understand it? Why is it important for teaching grace? Uh, Galatians 5, 7 through 10 says, you were running the race so well. Who has held you back from following the truth? It certainly isn't God, for he is the one who called you to freedom. Listen to this. This false teaching is like the little yeast that spreads throughout the whole batch or the whole lump of the dough. A little leaven corrupts the whole loaf. I am trusting the Lord, Paul said, to keep me from believing false teachings. God will judge that person, whoever he is, who has been confusing to you. God is not the author of confusion, but of order. And hear my heart loud and clear. The only way you're going to know a counterfeit is if you know the real thing. The only way you're going to know false teaching is if you know, by grace, true teaching. And you got to walk in that. Lastly, and I'm done. Y'all still track and say hallelujah. Lastly, and oh, I'm so grateful for this one. Saving grace saves me. Justifying grace begins to regenerate and justify and, and sanctification happens there. Sanctification continues through the teaching of the Word of God. It brings me to that final piece, which is glorification. So the final piece of grace, saving grace, justifying grace, teaching grace, is enabling or sufficient grace. Founded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says this, I prayed three times. I went to God's throne three times and asked for him to deliver me from this thorn in my flesh. Now, we know exactly what happened because the scripture tells us that Satan was sent to buffet him that he not become high-minded or prideful in the work that he was doing. Because he says, if anybody had the right to be prideful, it was me. I was a Pharisee among Pharisee. I was trained in the Sanhedrin. I was connected to Gamaliel. I'm part Roman citizen. I'm this, I'm that. I, I mean, all of these things he had. He said, yep, those things I count as trash, as dung. Here he says, I prayed Three times God would take this thorn in my flesh. It was affecting his flesh. Now, was it a spiritual battle? Yeah, but don't deny the fact that James says that when we sin, it's because we've drawn away of our flesh. What does he say about walking in the Spirit? You produce the fruit thereof. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, meekness, and so forth, called fruit of the Spirit. Conversely, he says right before that, but if you walk in the flesh, you'll do things like this. Sexual immorality, debauchery, uh, envying, fighting, quarrelings among you. Those are byproducts of your flesh. Now, here's what the Spirit does in Satan. He will attach himself to your physical drawaways, your physical urgencies. That's why, you know, that's why people can't give up pornography. If they only see it as a spiritual battle, they don't deal with the root cause, which was their flesh that led them to be drawn away by the Spirit. You got to deal with that flesh. Your flesh is weak. The Spirit can be willing. And listen, Satan can have no power. You can you shut him down in a New York minute, but you got to tame your flesh. Or you won't stop wanting. And that's what Satan... Listen, this, I can prove that to you. I, 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 I have not tempted with cocaine this morning. Some people are here going, you just don't know how good that is. To not be tempted by it, I mean. But there are things that tempt me this morning. So what is Satan going to tempt me with? 
something that my flesh is already weak in. Don't miss this. You will never break free until you tame that flesh by putting it under the blood covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that blood covenant that covers your inadequacies, that takes away the accusations, that determines what you listen to and what you apply. So, so what did he say? He says, I prayed three times, but Jesus came back and said, no. I don't take that thorn from your flesh. There's been conjecture, and we can do that till the cows come home. Was it that he was losing his eyesight? People say that because later in Scripture, he writes letters with, uh, uh, with big words, big letters. I don't know. It's conjecture. Some people say uh, it, was the, it was the fact that Satan buffeting him was telling him, hey, you remember what you used to do when you were Saul? Could have been conjecture. You know why I think we don't know? Because I think it can apply to any one of us for any thorn that's ever been in our flesh. And that's, that's how good God is, is he sees that I can say something, it applies to you, 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 and me. And it ain't just one thing, because I don't know what it's like to lose my sight. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. But I tell you one thing, I know what it means to have a thorn in my flesh. So he says this, I'm done. I'm not going to take it out because my grace, enabling grace, is sufficient for you. Paul, it's in your weakness that my strength is made perfect. How many of you know that God's strength is already perfect? You don't need to be made perfect. So let's rightly divide the word. He says, my strength will be made perfect. That word made means to become manifest, to be made manifest, to be brought into full view. So when I'm weak, which I don't want to be, I don't want to operate in, but when I'm weak, he's strong in me so that people see not my strength, but his strength. They view my weakness. They see that. My weakness is evident every single day that I get up here. I'm flawed. I'm broken. I'm in pursuit. I'm needy. I want. But in Christ, his strength rises up, and he says to you what he needs to say. So Paul said this. Therefore, if that's true, Lord, and it is, then I most gladly would rather boast in my infirmities. <laughs> Man, what a, what a statement. So that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I'll, I'll go through the infirmities so your strength can be seen in my weakness. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. In reproaches, so it's not just physical, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. Why? Because when I am weak, then I am strong. Saving grace. Justifying grace. Teaching grace. And oh, thank you, Lord. Sufficient grace. How many of you could say... Jesus, just by raising of hand, Jesus, I, I see your grace today. Just lift your hand if you learned something from him today. Just lift your hand. I'm not even looking at you. Just, Jesus, I learned something from you about your grace today. You can put your hands down. If you don't understand the levels of grace that we're referring to, about like reading the Bible and living above your infirmities, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, maybe you've never secured that place of saving grace. Well, Mark, you don't understand, I'm a good person. Well, the Bible says there's none good. There's none righteous except for Jesus. You can't get there from that. That's work-based theology. And that will fall you flat on your face. Why? Because if you don't live by grace, you're trying to live by the law. If you live by the law and you break one of them, you're guilty. But if you live by grace, you don't want to make mistakes, but you do. But His grace covers it yet again because we live from grace to grace, faith to faith. So if you want to give your life to Jesus today. I want you to pray with me right now to God. Say, dear Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for my sin. And I believe that you defeated death, hell, and the grave on my behalf and gave victory to me on your behalf. Tell him this. Say, I repent of all my sin. That is to say, I turn from it. I turn to you. Jesus, will you save me? I, I am confident that that's really all you got to say. Jesus, save me. Help me to live for you. I invite you to be Lord over all of my life. If you prayed that prayer today, we believe that's the greatest decision you will ever make this side of eternity, ever. But sometimes it's hard to...
stand up. So we in the churches have decided to let people fill out a card privately or what have you. And you know, if you've been here any amount of time, God said, Mark, you can't do that anymore. Because Mark, my word says, if they're ashamed of me before men, I, I, I'm going to stand ashamed of them before my father. They can't be ashamed of this gift that I've given them in parting grace and hope and salvation. So I'm asking you today, despite what the accuser may be trying to tell you, people are going to celebrate you. I'm not going to ask you to say anything, but if you prayed today and you invited Jesus in your heart, I want you to stand. I want you to stand for him right now. Just stand up right where you are. No thoughts, no concerns about what anybody. Praise the Lamb of God. Praise the Lamb of God. Amen, sister. Amen. Tracy, do you mind getting with this young lady and just giving her a card to fill out? We would just love to know who you are. Hey, you know what? Praise God for you. Praise God for you. Anyone else? I prayed, Mark, today, and I, I settled it out. Today, I made it sure. Amen. Would everyone stand? Everyone standing? Hey, this altar is open. Maybe there was a, a part of that grace story that you just want to come and, and just want to say, thank you, Jesus, for your grace. This altar is open for that. Maybe you want to come and pray. We had in the first service, we got a great report, a girl we prayed for last week, Shannon, which was the Lopez's um, um, re relative. I don't remember the relationship. Uh, they told her she had cancer. She was going for the next phase. Uh, she went back to the doctor, and they said, girl, you clean. You can go home. Gone. Gone. Don't, don't you tell me he can't do it. And then in the same retrospect, there was a lady here in this room this morning, Jody Murphy. They found a brain tumor on her brain, and they, they, they're saying it's not good. Okay, but what does he say? What does he say? How many of you believe, and I don't want you to patronize me, how many of you believe God is still in the healing business? How many of you believe that through the prayer of faith, God can heal Jody Murphy's brain and remove cancer and it be gone. Another lady stood right here and testified three different things. She went to the hospital. She was in ICU. They said she was in renal failure. They said her blood was poisoned for the lack of better words. She, she stood right here in the first service. She came in here and testified. She said, can I tell the, tell the church what's happened? And they were getting ready to do a surgery in her heart. And then they wouldn't let her leave. She was in ICU. They, they, they're talking dialysis. I, I assume her husband went through that. I'm not sure if he passed away from that. That's my impression. And, and then long story short, she, she lays hands upon herself and prays over herself in the mighty name of Jesus. And um, she said it, when it was all said and done, the, the cardiologist came back in there. They didn't just let her go home. He came back in there. He said, Here, here's what we think could have happened. We could have misplaced your blood for somebody else's blood. She said, no, it was God. It was only God. And so, so maybe today it's, it's that that you seek. God healed me of Crohn's disease in 1995. And always oh, lied to me so many times. He said, Mark, you're not healed. I'll have a little sickness in my stomach. And I just have to say, I, I reject that lie from you. You're an accuser. I, I know God healed me. And I stand on that and. Does anybody today need to come for prayer for something going on in their life? Whatever it may be, if you want to join our church. Hey, what are we singing? Amazing grace, my chains are gone. Maybe you need to take off some chains today. I want you to come. If you've never come and prayed, come pray for Jody. If nothing else, come pray for Jody today and believe God uh, for this miracle in her life. Y'all come. My chains are gone. I've been set free. God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy and end in love, amazing love. My chains are gone, cause I've been set free. If anybody wants to come and pray with us, we've got this two families standing in for Mookie Robinson. Mookie is a miracle, living miracle from COVID. 
and we prayed for him. We believed for him. They said he was not going to make it. He made it. He's come to church. He's now they found some uh, some kind of cancer cells in his mouth. And uh, hey, I know he's running after God's heart. So if you believe in the power of prayer, come, and we're going to pray uh, over this family. We're going to pray as an intercessor. Father, in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus, take the intercession of these precious, precious friends of Mookie Robinson. God, we've seen you do it before, and God, we know that you can do it again. We plead the blood of Jesus over Mookie's body. We, we speak to those cancer cells and say, be gone in the mighty name of Jesus. You have no way in his life. Lord, we don't do that upon our authority, but the authority of you, Jesus. You are the great physician. You are the great healer. We pray you would manifest your strength in his weakness. We pray you would do it not just because of our love and the love this family has for Mookie, uh, but because of the love you have for him. God, I know because I've seen it firsthand. They will shout from the rooftops that you are God and there's none other. Lord, we praise you in advance for all you're going to do. And we plead again the, the powerful name of Jesus over Mookie's body and his life. Great physician, great healer, have your way. Show us your glory, and we will give you the praise for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Whew. Praise God. All right. If the Lord bless you this morning, say amen and give him praise. to Jesus. Come on, Crystal. <laughs> Praise the Lord, Seth. Guys. Well, cool. I hope God bless you this morning. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, kids play practices today from 2 to 4 o'clock. For just those of you who Miss Amanda reached out to, uh, so uh, just, I guess, some of our folks that have parts, speaking parts, that kind of thing, they'll be here in the sanctuary. And then also, baptism is coming up next Sunday. So if you haven't signed up for baptism and you would like to, you can see one of the ladies at the welcome desk or visit our website, northridgethomaston.com. Oh, I didn't have it on. My bad. And then after, uh, like Pastor Mark said, uh, Fall Festival is coming up October 30th at Matthews Field, 5 to 8. We need volunteers, and uh, we also need a lot of candy. So if you want to go out and grab a couple bags of candy, uh, two, bag, two or three bags for here, one bag for my house would be great. Uh, volunteer appreciation coming up November 17th. Also opportunity to volunteer at the Christmas show uh, coming up. So see uh, Pastor Tyler right here. Um, just rush the stage. It'll be great. And then uh, don't forget about this. If you've, if you've lost anything in here, which I know my hands are up, if, if you've lost anything in here, left a cup, anything like that, uh, we have probably been storing it for years in this little counter back here. So if that is you, do you want to go check it out? You can come check it out. After next week, it's going to be on our Facebook page, Raising Money for Kids Building. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, we're probably going to throw it away. But just to let you know, it is probably back there. We've got sunglasses. we got all kind of stuff back there. So head back there to that area. If that is you, you will probably find it. I'm going to pray for us. We'll head out today. God, we thank you so much for who you are. God, we just ask that you will be with us, continue to guide us, continue to lead us. Father, I pray and thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for the salvation that happened today. Thank you for the healing that has taken place. God, honestly, we just thank you for everything you are doing in this church, your church. God, may we continue just to be the humbled hands and feet of you and shine your light in the world today. Go before us this week, and we ask for your strength and your strength alone. In your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. God, have a great week.